Yuria. Defiled and dressed in rags, you might not mark her as a witch if not for that iconic pointed hat. Legends attest that witches have been wearing this peculiar style of headwear since long ago, which implies that magic women were common back then. Tour the Nexus, and you'll find a plethora of statues depicting women, wrapped in robes, masked by hoods. Befriend the Monumental, and she reveals that she too is female. For in Demon Souls, women have a unique capacity for the soul arts. For them, sorcery is commonly this art of emotion. It's intuited from feeling, rather than developed through contemplation. Frake wields a different type of magic from my witchcraft. Frake's magic stems from an understanding of the essence of the demon soul, while my witchcraft merely channels its energy. If the demon is cursed, so shall be the craft. Frake's power comes from human potential, while mine is a dark, dependent art. So when you find a demon soul, you take it to Yuria to manifest its power, not Frake. I feel great misgivings about Frake. I was branded a witch at a very young age and have been persecuted ever since. Although I never had ill intentions, this black craft of mine is intrinsically evil. If there is a god, he gave us souls to do good, not to practice witchcraft. My accusers detested my dark arts for good reason. For the path I have taken is tainted. But I am afraid that Frake, too, has ventured down the wrong path. He has become obsessed with the dark arts. The dark arts and witches have an evil reputation, because here in this nexus, years ago, women seem to have done what men could not. Here, their unique proficiency for soul magic was used to its fullest potential to worship, to study, and to eventually awaken the Old One. This led to the first scourge, to demons, and to the defilement of half the world. If there was any one member responsible for awakening the Old One, then it was the Maiden in Black. This witch demonstrates a motherly tenderness with the demon, and was one of its most powerful servants during this time. Like other witches, she would have channeled its power, and the power of the Old One was dark indeed. The Old One's magic is to absorb souls, claiming them through a network of demons in the fog. Skewered with spears likely dropped from the Nexus, the Old One appears to be unkillable, so, with countless souls lost, the fabric of reality broken, and all their kingdoms reduced to ruin, the Monumentals appear to have settled for a half-measure. They forced the Old One into slumber, imprisoned it in their Sky Temple, and took it to the far reaches of human habitation, where they hoped the beast might never be disturbed again. The Maiden, defiled and dressed in black, was blinded with wax and forced to tend to the candles within the shrine. She is the shame of the Monumentals, a disastrous product of their culture's obsession with magic. Countless people would have ended up displaced from this, and the all-consuming fog would have also exacerbated the number of impoverished refugees. Busy with the war, no nation would have accepted these poor men and women, forcing them all to wander the earth. To repair the fabric of reality, six archstones were constructed and given to the remaining leaders of men. The ambitious king, the digger king, the intelligent queen, the priest to the shadow men, the giants, and yes, even to the chief of those wandering poor. Starved of magic during this period, many of these cultures collapsed. This would have affected the poor people of the world with no magic arts to heal them, and no nation welcoming them, the chief of these vagrants led them deep into the western valley, where no one would mind their poverty. This place, it's a proper mound of rubbish. All the rot of the world, living or not, ends up here. Here, anarchy reigns. The poor scavenge for food, shelter, and wares. Diseased vermin bite and suck their soiled skin. Merchants lie and cheat, and... A cannibal even roams the swamp. 
It should come as no surprise then that the chief's duty to their archstone was quickly forgotten. Why should they care about the outside world when it had all but abandoned them? To make matters worse, above a new religion was gaining power, a priesthood from the land of Murd, whose temples quickly came to span the continent, especially in the western highlands. They had a belief in a singular deity, a god who seeks all that is pure and good and rejects all that is perceived to be impure and evil. As a result, we see higher ranking priests achieve saintly status by remaining pure in every sense, sequestering themselves in their temples, devoted to prayer, reciting miracles that reject death, selfishness, disease, poison, but most reviled of all was magic. It was those evil sorcerers and magicians that caused a near apocalypse, so the priests' anti-magic stance would have made their religion ripe for popularity. They built upon the monumental's ban on soul magic, taking steps to oppress any who practice the craft regardless of intentions or circumstance, and Uria serves as our foremost example of this. Now, while the soul arts are a distant memory at this point in history, artifacts from this bygone age still exist. Take the Ring of Magical Nature, for example. Cursed witches were believed to be born holding this ring, making artifacts like these objects of extreme fear and superstition. Unless the church found them, of course, then they were considered divine revelations instead. For example, there was the Moonlight Sword, granted to Temple Knight Vizzo, the Istarel, given to Temple Knight Rosaya, Blind, given to Selen Vinland, and Bramd, taken up by her brother Gal. But perhaps most special of all was a ring of sincere prayer, an artifact found by a truly lucky young girl, leading to her instant rise as the sixth saint, Astraya. So is she a saint or a witch? It's here that we arrive at the biggest twist that Demon Souls has to offer, that magic and miracles are two sides of the same coin, and that the old one is at the heart of it all. Why else would all of the most powerful saints of the temple be women? Why else were miracles energized alongside magic when the old one was awakened? Why did the priests' talismans of God resemble the old one? It's simple, because their so-called God is the old one. His miracles are the soul arts, and women can more easily channel this magic, whether they be witches or saints. Prayer is for the foolish, quaint, and soon to be dead. And heaven forbid the day you find out what their so-called god really is. The temple believes whatever best suits their politics, so when they cast their arrogant gaze towards the denizens of the valley, they didn't see the needy, they saw sinners being punished by God. However, this couldn't be farther from the truth. I find something odd about this place. It brims with grime, but at once feels strangely pure. The lost and unclean are simply victims of circumstance. Circumstances that the temple helped to create when they abandoned them. Circumstances that Astraya, the sixth saint, set out to resolve. During the early days of the Second Scourge, Astraya was quick to embark on a relief mission to Boletaria, and in the years after entering the Tear, she discovered the existence of the Valley. How many years has it been that witch Astraya came to this Valley with that squid-headed knight? Those ridiculous white robes of hers. I swear I caught her glaring at my son in disgust. Yes, yes, it's true, she is as nasty as they come. For a woman whose luck saved her from both poverty and plague, seeing the poor and afflicted came as a shock, which the filthy woman misinterprets here as contempt. In truth, the clergywoman's heart ached for their suffering, and unlike her peers in the church, she came from nothing, so she better understood their plight, and so she began to question for the first time, why had God permitted their pain? If there is a natural evil, it is not those who were forced to live in the valley, it is God, so cruel and unjust to allow suffering in his creation. 
And so, Astraea chose to bring salvation to those people abandoned, just like the trash of the valley. But healing magic can only go so far. In order to reach the root of the problem, she needed to take away the source of thoughts which bring pain, the soul. And so, she became an archdemon for the Old One. Gaining the power to rob the living of their souls, she embraced the filthy, ridding them of their suffering, and for that, they revere her. All the men worship her, the same men who would snatch my child away from me. Astraea sits on a mountain of gold and corpses. Both are offerings from the men of the valley, who are desperate to repay their debt to the woman who loved them. Any soul will do, making it a terrifying place for people like the filthy woman and the temple knights who embarked in pilgrimage here. Have you heard the rumors about Astraea of the Valley of Defilement? They claim that she and her royal knight have become demons and lead a clan of degenerate miscreants. In truth, the rumors are surely unfounded. There are all sorts of wrongdoers down there who would think up such nonsense. Yet if the rumors are true, then may she be eternally damned for her debasement of the Lord's name. By this point, her bodyguard, Gal Vinland, should have stepped in and purified her for her sacrilege. He came from a truly noble and powerful family within the temple, so he risks everything by standing by her side. But, of course, he had to. He had seen the same things that she had, and the knight would have been inspired by her sincere faith, so he bravely stood in solidarity with her decision. How dare you persist in intruding upon our haven? You abandoned us long ago. What right do you have? But good intentions do not make you immune from spreading evil. Instead, here, this simply heightens the tragedy. Dearest Astraea, I have failed you. You killed him, didn't you? Very well. I can no longer resist you. Do as you like. Take your precious demon soul. Astraea, defiled and dressed in white, has a soul that grants spells of death, relief, and resurrection. She is, at once, the most impure demon of them all, but also closer to God than any saint before her. So ask yourself, slayer of demons, do the ends justify the means? So. I love making lore videos, but I like listening to lore as well, and one of my favourite things to listen to right now is Mythos. It's a collection of Greek myths on Audible, and it's an audiobook that you can listen to for free during your 30-day Audible trial. So I'm going to play a sample, and while you listen to it, go and visit audible.com slash vartividya, or text vartividya to 500-500, and you'll be able to start your free trial right now. The Shattered World was still smoking from the savagery of war. Zeus saw that it needed to heal, and he knew that his own generation, the third order of divine beings, must manage better than the first two had done. It was time for a new order, an order purged of the wasteful bloodlust and elemental brutality that had marked earlier times. To the victors, the spoils. Like a chief executive who has just completed a hostile takeover, Zeus wanted the old management out and his people in. So many of the games that we enjoy are influenced by Greek mythologies, and it's just great to have a deeper understanding of these things. More importantly, perhaps, Mythos is also excellently narrated by Stephen Fry, and it allows him to perfectly recount his many jokes and witticisms, uh, keeping you entertained throughout. When you get an audiobook that is narrated by the person who wrote it, it just adds an extra layer to that experience, because they know exactly how to present what they're saying. Uh, before I go, remember, your membership also includes access to their Plus catalogue, which grants unlimited access to thousands of select originals, audiobooks, and podcasts. So, no matter what you're into, they've probably got it. So again, go and visit audible.com slash vartividya or text vartividya to 500-500 to get started today. And thank you to Audible for sponsoring this video.